try to make this as painless as possible. Um, how much tidal volume in mechanically ventilated patients with ARDS? So uh, we'll, we'll start. I want you to think, if, if you were asked what tidal volume um, to set on a recently intubated ICU-admitted patient with consolidated right lower lobe pneumonia, 55 male, no history of COPD, the uh, rest of the chest x-ray looks clear, on 50% of oxygen and five of PEEP. Um, I want you to think about a number between four and 10. Okay, you got your number? Okay, I should say everybody close your eyes but me. <laughs> then you might raise your hand. So, uh, hey, how many would use 10? Nine. Eight. You better bail out before four. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Few fives, um, you know, six may have been even more than seven. Um, anybody more than 10? Okay. Talk sort of short, I was trying to kill a little bit of time here. At the start. <laughs> no, actually the next, the next talk is uh, pretty short. This is about regular size. Uh, so um, I, I want to tell you a story about when I was uh, a resident uh, during when we first started uh, understanding the disease or the syndrome of ARDS. You know, people wondered where the tidal volumes came from that we used to use because we used to use big tidal volumes and we used them whether it was ARDS or not. It was just what we used for any mechanically ventilated patient. Um, this particular um, study uh, from 1963 uh, published some data uh, in the operating room. So these operating room looking at what happens if you use low tidal volumes in the operating room versus what happens if you use, I'm sorry, if you use big tidal volumes in the operating room, your oxygen stays up, maybe goes down a little bit, but if you use small tidal volumes in the operating room, uh, your, your PO2 really uh, takes a dive. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, we use tidal volumes probably from 12 to 15 for years. And uh, I remember when I was a resident, there was a, a, a patient, this is not the same patient, but it was a Friday afternoon. I think I was a second year resident, uh, patient with really bad uh, ARDS, uh, young man, uh, had, I think, leukemia, uh, neutropenic. I uh, don't think he was that thrombocytopenic. Um, but he was at the brink is what we could do for him based on technology uh, back in 77. And uh, what I was told to do was to help the fellow put in bilateral chest tubes, and uh, we put the patient on 50 a peep and uh, 12 mLs per kg, I'm sure, tidal volume. Uh, I don't remember if he survived or not, but I know some of those patients did survive. Um, so, and then uh, data, because this is the uh, second generation CAT scanner. Um, <laughs> But then we began to understand that we were ventilating small lung and uh, the idea from Hickling, probably in the early 80s even, um, uh, based on animal experiments, uh, should have made us think about volume trauma, but it didn't. 
And uh, even in 98, we were still making the point with rat lungs that you can't uh, over distend without injuring. And then the one of the few uh, landmark studies, positive studies, uh, the ARMA trial uh, showed a 22% reduction in mortality comparing a 12 with a 6 ml per kg tidal volume. You know, now everyone still remembers that trial, even because it's part of critical care history. Uh, and, and we'll come back to that trial because it's uh, the PREVENT trial, which I'm going to finish the talk with. Uh, there's some nice historical reflections about this trial that relate uh, to the PREVENT trial. Uh, and we had ARGENET peep, peep tables for uh, depending on the severity of oxygenation. Uh, and we had uh, low tidal volumes uh, based on predicted body weight or ideal body weight, PW, PBW or IBW. And, and then there was a period uh, where we were having trouble getting low tidal volumes implemented in ARDS patients uh, despite the evidence. And we really weren't paying a lot of attention to non-ARDS patients as to what we should be doing. You know, I can remember uh, being upset or being bothered because I take care of post-op cardiovascular surgery patients. And the respiratory care practitioner in the U.S., we have respiratory care practitioners that, uh, that set the ventilators. I, you know, I'd find those patients on ARGENET tidal volumes and uh, be hypoxemic, and uh, we're trying to quickly get them off the ventilator. And, uh, you know, I would chastise them, you know, by saying you shouldn't be using low tidal volumes in these patients, but that's about that thought process, uh, you know, literature uh, may clearly misdirected my thinking. So this is the first trial I wanted to talk about. Um, this was the first NETO trial, which was a meta-analysis. Um, over 2,000 patients uh, with ARDS, uh, breaking them into two groups. The mean of the, uh, the first half tile uh, 4.15 uh, ml per kg, ideal body weight, um, six point four five in the low tidal volume group and ten point six in the high tidal volume group per kilogram. And then the gra average gradient uh, of the comparisons, either these were either observational data uh, or there were a few randomized trials, but this just gives you an idea of the separation uh, in these studies that compared uh, lower and higher tidal volumes. Uh, uh, 4.15 was the mean with the range of two to six between the two comparator groups. And the conclusion was uh, that there was protection with the lower tidal volumes and better clinical outcomes, but some of the limitations was the quality of the evidence-based medicine uh, was not ideal because of heterogeneity of the clinical trials. And the better clinical outcomes with the lower tidal volumes, and again, I think it's important to remember uh, this was comparing 6.45 with 10.6 mean between the uh, protective and the conservative group. Uh, better mortality, less lung injury, less pulmonary infection, and less atelectasis. I never quite understood atelectasis, and I hadn't talked to Neto. I don't know why it was, you know, put in there. It might have been put in for the other reason. They figured with the low tidal volume. 
uh, they might actually get more type, uh, more atelectasis, but it actually went the other way. Uh, limitations, uh, publication bias. Uh, people may tend to only get energetic about publishing data that shows a difference. And they were, um, the minority were not randomized perspective trials. Uh, that was in 2012. In 2013, uh, there was an intraoperative study, uh, 400 total patients, a pulmonary risk score of greater than two, uh, compared six to eight uh, mLs per kg, uh, ideal body weight during the OR with 10 to 12, uh, actually achieved a 6.4 uh, versus 11.1. Uh, in the low tidal volume group, they used intraoperative PEEP. Um, in the and recruitment maneuvers in the conservative or comparator higher tidal volume group, they used zero PEEP in the operating room, uh, and they uh, did not use recruitment maneuvers. Primary outcome was a composite uh, of. Uh, pneumonia, acute respiratory failure, sepsis, septic shock, and death. And I can see, uh, I don't know whether you can see, but, but I can see uh, that both at seven uh, and at 30 days, uh, they had a composite outcome difference that was less than uh, 0 0.001, uh, favoring the low tidal volume. And uh, you probably can see this, and that just shows a nice separation with the lung protection doing better. And the, the only limitation of this study that, that I can find, uh, as I read the, the article, was it was not just a study of low tidal volume in the operating room, but level of PEEP was different. And then the second NETO study, um, which I think is Bear, I keep mentioning, how many people have, are aware of the PREVENT trial? Um, so Netter went back and looked at pretty much the same data as the 2012 trial. There were some additional studies. And now broke it into three tertiles, uh, less, equal than or less than seven, uh, between seven and 10 and greater than 10 and looked at the data again. And what you see here uh, was the significance was between uh, the greater or equal than 10 uh, versus the seven or less. And in between seven and 10, even though the complications were greater, um, it was not statistically significant. And the take home message here was it's, it was that higher group, the 10 or more, that seemed to be making the biggest difference in the ability to show outcome difference. And uh, the, the hazard ratios show that uh, the difference uh, between the uh, 10 and higher and the 7 and lower uh, was pretty consistent across uh, age, uh, sex, respiratory rate, and other things. And then in uh, 2017, the Love ED trial, uh, the lead author um, was one of my previous chief fellows at, uh, in Camden that's now at Wash U in St. Louis. And uh, what his group did at a, multiple hospitals was put in place an education program in the emergency department uh, so that uh, all patients that got mechanically ventilated uh, had attention play, played to lower tidal volume. And uh, ended up with uh, over 1,700 patients in the trial. Uh, and what you can see uh, that the tidal volumes in these patients uh, pre-intervention and post-intervention, you can see the big jump from the black to the gray in the smaller tidal volumes uh, versus 
um, the higher tidal volumes and you won't be able to see this uh, uh, but uh, this just looks at uh, the variables uh, in the pre-intervention and the intervention group and there really isn't a lot of difference in the group and the outcome analysis uh, between the inter pre and post intervention uh, it shows that there was less ARDS, there were less ventilator associated complications, more ventilator free days, more hospital free days, more ICU free days, and uh, a trend in decreased mortality. And I can barely see that. Um, and then the uh, prevent trial. Uh, all the data that I have been showing you is uh, non-perspective randomized trial data in these non-ARDS uh, mechanically ventilated patients. Um, uh, this was the uh, first trial uh, done in Netherlands, uh, multi multi multiple hospitals, effect of a low versus intermittent tidal volume strategy on ventilator-free days in intensive care unit patients without uh, ARDS. Uh, 961 patients total enrolled. Uh, low versus intermediate tidal volumes used the Berlin ARDS definition. Uh, patients had to be randomized within uh, one hour uh, of identification. And the Study design was that the low tidal volume group got six mLs per kg initially and then decreased to as low as four if tolerated, uh, ideal body weight. Uh, and they allowed pressure support. I guess uh, pressure uh, maintenance pressure support ventilation uh, must be a very common mode of uh, maintenance mechanical ventilation in the Netherlands. Uh, because you'll see that a lot of these people went on pressure support uh, ventilation maintenance fairly quickly. Um, with a decrease to five of pressure support uh, to as low as five to try to get the tidal volume down. Um, if it was higher than the target. And then the intermediate comparator group uh, was 10 ml uh, per kg ideal body weight, which is right at the very break point uh, between the tertile analysis of Neto. And then it could be decreased if uh, the plateau pressure was uh, greater than 25. And again, uh, you can see that they're using a lot of pressure support here, uh, allowed up to 25. Uh, and the uh, clinical outcome of patients uh, in the low and intermediate tidal volume groups, and uh, I can almost see it better off this big one than I can the little one on this, the screen. but. Uh, the the take-home message of this trial uh, was that there was no difference uh, uh, between the two groups. Um, you can see the the Kaplan-Meier curves for 30-day, uh, 90-day uh, intensive care unit stay, hospital stay, uh, really made no difference uh, with that comparison. Uh, the limitations of this study uh, was that uh, blinding obviously is not possible. Um, it was a very heterogeneous group of patients, uh, but a sensitivity analysis, and a sensitivity analysis is if you have a primary group of interest, uh, you want to see if there is consistency uh, in uh, no uh, difference uh, between the groups when you look at groups of interest like uh, sepsis and pneumonia uh, that consistently uh, showed uh, very similar outcomes across all the primary and secondary endpoints. And 
although the intent of the study was to compare 10 uh, with 4 to 6, in actuality, uh, the means on the two comparator groups uh, were 7 and 9. So all you people that raised your hand from 7 to 9, uh, you, at least this trial would say that you're, you're all about in the same ballpark. Now the question, um, it's unlikely that 10 is going to be better. Uh, the question would be, would 6 be better or would 5 be better? You know, I think that's, that's the question. Uh, concerns with low tidal volume ventilation. Um, the main concern is need for more sedation and the link between sedation and delirium. Ventilator dyssynchrony and greater inspiratory effort uh, based on the mode. I mean, there would be some concern with pressure support ventilation where you were thinking of the pressure limit when you set the pressure control value, what you don't know is how much inspiratory pull the patient is adding to treat, create transpulmonary pressure, which is what we're really concerned about. So if we're concerned about ventilator-induced lung injury, it, it's really not as much about plateau pressure as it is transpulmonary pressure. And if you don't know the pressure in the pleural space, you don't know the transpulmonary pressure. And if you know the esophageal pressure, you know a little more. Uh, not ideal, but you uh, know a little more. And then body habitus gets factored in. Um, uh, but, you know, just a couple of thoughts. Um, 58% of the low tidal volume group were on pressure support by day one. So, you know, what was their transpulmonary pressure? Um, and the, the last point I'm going to make is the separation between treatment groups. Because if you remember when the ARDSNET ARMA trial came out, with the 6 ml per kg versus the 12, you know, there was a big uproar from some public, uh, some concerned academic physicians uh, that this was, uh, should not be approved by IRB uh, because this was comparing uh, 12 mLs per kg, which was not in clinical use. I think most of us feel that it was uh, and that it was appropriately comparison. But if you want to try to prove a point, you try to get a big separation between whatever the variable is that you're studying. And certainly seven versus nine is, is not a big separation. How many people are aware um, of the Clover's trial? Have you all talked about this at the meeting? The Clover's trial is the, uh, the ARGENET uh, derivant uh, group, the pedal group, that are comparing in the early resuscitation of septic shock are comparing more vasoconstrictors to maintain your, to hit your and maintain your MAP target and less fluids or more fluids and less vasopressors because you can all of us have an MAP we think we need for tissue perfusion for our patient, and it may be 70, it may be 75, maybe 65, but you can get there two ways. You can get there with more flow and less squeeze, or you can get there with uh, more flow and less squeeze, or more squeeze and less flow to achieve the same mean arterial pressure. So the, this is studying uh, that question, uh, there's been criticisms of this study by similar watchdog groups uh, that it's more of an animal experiment because the restriction of fluids in the vasopressor group, in their opinion, is extreme. And the amount of fluids that are being given before vasopressors uh, in the uh, 
a lot of fluids, a little vasopressors is extreme, but uh, that trial is uh, two thirds done. So uh, it won't be too much longer uh, before. And since this is, Guillermo, I, you always let us, since this is a mechanical ventilation sepsis conference, I can go back and make a sepsis comment that this has, we'll see how that trial turns out, but it has influenced my practice somewhat. Um, I'm not as aggressive in lowering vasopressors in that first 24 hours of septic shock if I've got it down to a reasonable number like 10 mics of norepi and I've got good urine output and my lactate is coming down and, and uh, even if my patient is, even if I call uh, Professor Tabool and said, I got this patient here and how do I tell if he's fluid responsive, you know, I, because I want to give him some more fluid. That, that patient, even if they're fluid responsive, because the, the thought is if you keep giving fluids to maintain MAP, you're going to leak more. So if, if, you're, if you're continuing to give in fluids as a vasopressor spare and your target is to get norepi off, as sort of my target used to be, um, you know, I'd rather kill the bug, squash the toxin, get rid of the pro-inflammatory mediators that are causing the leak, maybe end up with less fluid uh, out in the interstitial. So my last slide, going back, how many people remember we're talking about tidal, setting tidal volume in non-ARDS mechanically ventilated patients? So I'm, I'm paraphrasing Gordon Rubenfell, who uh, wrote the editorial um, for the article about um, what maybe clinicians are thinking as they look at all this, these trials. Some uh, who believed in the meta-analyses will likely to continue to target tidal volume of six or lower. Clinicians who view the current evidence as pointing to the harm of tidal volumes of 10 or more will likely avoid that range uh, because that group really wasn't studied in, in this, uh, in the PREVENT trial. And clinicians may feel that they have two options based on patient tolerance and concern for ARD, ARDS risk. So if your patient is, is tolerating lower tidal volumes, I think the, the general thought these days is that lower plateau pressure, lower driving pressure, uh, are still all good. And if your patient says, I'm fine with five, seems to like it just as good as seven, let them have five. If they don't like it, you know, then you're, you don't want to sedate them to get it down. And if, the only, if they only like eight or they only like nine without a lot of sedation, then you might say, go ahead because I'm going to treat each patient different. Um, and I did have one last point. Um, the the uh, trial that was, I, I've forgotten the name of the trial, so I'm sure some of you know it. This was the big trial where they did a, a prevalence uh, trial. It's a snapshot of who's in everybody's units, uh, hundreds and thousands of patients. And um, the the take-home message from this trial looked at incidents of ARDS, and 40% of ARDS cases were not recognized despite meeting criteria for Berlin diet definition, uh, which means that the importance of having a default that my team uh, uses 8 mLs per kg is you better make sure your team is identifying all the patients that have ARDS, because if you're not, then you're going to be doing some things that are maybe not in the best interest. Now, most of these patients that were not recognized uh, were the milder form of ARDS. Thank you.